Guitar Interactive uh, is here with Mr. Paul Gilbert. Steve Rosen, what's happening? The redoubtable, the inimitable, the always controversial, but never trivial Mr. Paul Gilbert. Thanks for all those adjectives. Absolutely. We've known each other for a long time um, uh, over the years. And uh, I actually had a dream about you. True story. After we started communicating about putting this interview together, I, I had a dream. You had taken two humbucker pickups and you were carrying them around like by the cables, like they were severed heads and you were looking for a guitar to put them in. I mean, this is true. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Yeah. I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty interesting. Cause I mean, you, you know, we think about your records and fuzz universe and the pedals and Paul Gilbert, the, 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 the sound master. I mean, was that always a pursuit, a pursuit of yours in terms of, you know, tinkering with tones and, going for the ultimate sounds and, and, and changing guitars and, I mean, is that who you were or did that kind of come later? I mean... Let's see, well way back of course I knew nothing about guitar or gear and uh, I'm trying to think of the first thing that I discovered, well I had an acoustic guitar for two years so that, uh, I remember being, the, the strings were a mystery because I broke a string. The first string that I broke was the low E because that was the only string that I played for two years. <laughs> and, and I broke the low E and I thought, oh, now what do I do? I'm, you know, I went down to the music store. I brought my guitar because I thought that they would have to measure to make sure they got the right length of string. And I didn't know whether it was called the sixth string or the first string. And I took a guess and I guessed wrong. I called it the first string, and they're like, no, that's the sixth string, son. <laughs> and uh, they said, it doesn't, we don't have to measure, they're, they're all long, you just cut it off. I was like, oh, you know, I learned so much in that first music store visit. And uh, then I finally got an electric guitar, and uh, it was a really good guitar. It was a Gibson Les Paul Custom. It was used. Wow. It was $300 out of the, you know, the want ads in the paper. And uh, I, I had saved up $150 from mowing the lawn. And my parents kicked in another 150 for Christmas, and they told me, you know, you can you can either have toys like you usually have because I was 11, you know, or you can have no toys at all, and and we'll pay for half the guitar. And I'm like, I'm, I'm 11 now, I can I can do it, and I was really excited about the guitar, but at the same time, Christmas morning there were no toys, and you know, I sort of. You know, it was a little sad, you know, no, no G.I. Joes to play with, no uh, Erector sets or Legos. But that was really my passage into manhood, I felt, you know, wow. that, you know, I could, th this was my toy. You know, this was, this was my, you know, I was, I'm getting serious now. You know, I get an electric guitar. Now, I did not have an amp. So, uh, I had a cassette player that had a, a quarter inch jack for the, for the mic inputs. Right. So I plugged it in there and if you turn the, the input level all the way up, it would, you'd get a really ugly kind of distortion, but it was still distortion. And uh, so I played with that for a while. And then finally I got a Fender Vibro Champ, six watts. Six watts. And it was a pretty loud six watts. <laughs> and I remember the, the lady at the music store, actually I, I got mine used, but a friend of mine had bought a new one. And when he bought his, the lady told him, don't, turn it louder than three or it will break <laughs> and so both of us you know we, I had a used one he had a new one and we were both terrified like and and, and three sounded so much better than two and so we're like well maybe we'll just try three and a half you know and, oh it sounded so much better you know and within a week we're all we're both on ten you know and and the, I think the first actual tweak I learned was to just bring up the humbucker close to the to the strings and it got a little louder and so we could, you know, because we're, of course, trying to get distortion. And, and this is, you know, Fender Vibro is a pretty clean amp by yeah. today's standards. There's no master volume or, or, you know, preamp or gain or anything. So we're just trying every little thing. We're get the pickup as close as possible. And uh, and I didn't even know that there were such things as, as, as pedals. And then my uncle, who's a really good guitar player, introduced me, you know, took me to a music store. He's like, oh, yeah, these, this is something called an MXR Distortion Plus. And uh, I never actually heard one, but the, the name was exciting. <laughs> and then there was also, you know, I was looking through some magazines and DiMarzio had a Super Distortion pickup. And I remember thinking that those two pieces of gear probably did an identical thing. You know, that the DiMarzio <laughs> Super Distortion, you know, you just immediately have nothing but fuzz all the time. And the Super, or the MXR Distortion Plus, they both had distortion in the name. It turns out that the, the pickup 
just gave you more output and would drive your amp to have a subtle more amount of distortion, you know, and uh, where the the pedal actually was was much more of a radical effect. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but I ended up getting a super distortion pickup for my for my guitar, and and uh, the first pedals I actually bought were um, an Electro Harmonics Hot Tubes, wow. which was a distortion pedal, and a and a Screaming Tree, which was a treble booster, and. That was great. It, it really, I, I thought it sounded wonderful. I get, and the, I remember the first thing that happened is I, you know, of course, turned everything up to as, as much as it would go, and it was just, you know, turned my guitar into a fire-breathing feedback monster, which I had no idea how to control. So I, I actually have a, I have a cassette of when I was 11 years old. My uncle was playing my little toy drum set I had, and we're jamming and we're doing like, uh, we'll what was, we're doing like. Uh, <laughs> shelter just over and over again and uh, and then it, we would end and first of all I didn't know how to end so I'd just be like you know, he'd be like you know, and I was scared to stop because I knew if I stopped the guitar would just go you know feedback and and I had no idea how to stop it and, and my uncle taught me some of the greatest things in the world then you know I'm 11 years old and he says Turn your volume down <laughs> on your guitar. Now, you know, I, I do a lot of teaching, and and this is a habit of mine. I mean, I, I turn my, my volume down like I breathe. You know, it's just I don't have to think about it. Wow. But I, I can always tell a, a guitar player that's never played loud or played in a band because when they're done playing, they do this. It's like no, you, you know, now you're free. You Absolutely. know, and and whenever I you know turn it on, zip, it's up. <laughs> down, you know. And it's, it's just, I mean, that, that has a lot to do with this, this instrument because I wanted the volume to be something that I could find in the dark. You know, it's not like in a jungle of other knobs, it's just mm -hmm. wonk, it's the first thing I come to. And because uh, that, that same Les Paul had those horrible little um, metal spiky things yeah, yeah. That, that come up and show you where, where you know, what number your knob is, is on. Yeah. So I would, you know, I'd be playing, because I was in a band, you know, and so I'm playing, you know, <laughs> with, with, with some force. I'd come to hit that volume, and my pinky would go right into that metal thing, and there'd be blood, and it'd be horrible. You know? <laughs> so finally, my, my dad and I, you know, my dad was, was smarter than I was, so he could figure out how to get the knobs out, and we removed those things, we ended up putting the volume in the back. And ever since then, I've always rewired guitars to have the volume, you know, where most people... You know, they're used to it being, you know, somewhere in the jungle of knobs, but wow. I always have mine right on the edge. So, you know, it's the first thing that you come to. Interesting. So having the, the, the fireman is kind of all your dreams put together. It's it is. everything it, that you've ever wanted in it, a guitar. It's, it's the most fantastic guitar. I love this thing so much. I mean, of course, it's, it's got that little, you know, squirrely reversal of the knobs. That, that's, that's something I like. But um, the, from having a big guitar collection, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing to play with, I started to wonder why certain guitars just sounded better, regardless of pickup or... You mean other people playing them why they sounded better or sounded better when you played them? Well, when I played them, you know, I, I had, at one point had over 100 guitars and I'd be like, why do these five, why do I keep going back to these? Why do they sound better? And the, the thing that they had in common was a thick neck joint and a pretty thick neck. And uh, and so I started experimenting with, with that and uh, I... I had this idea for the an upside down Iceman, just because I always thought the Iceman was cool. Because Paul Stanley played one, Rick Nielsen played one, and uh, <laughs> you know, growing up in the '70s, those those were two of my, you know, I, I love those, love the you know, Kiss and Cheap Trick. So, uh, but I wanted to make the guitar my own, you know, to do something that, that had my own signature. So I had the idea of flipping it upside down, you know, putting a cutaway so I could get up here, and uh, and and just having a thick a thicker neck on it. Mm -hmm. Now the the Iceman is also a um, Three or not a three quarter, a uh, twenty four and three quarter scale guitar. So it's a little bit shorter than like the RGs and the PGMs and the and the gems. You know, those are more of a strat scale. So I could use thicker strings. You know, I could throw a set of tens in there and and, and still have be able to bend it pretty easily. And a th thicker neck and uh, of course, you know, I always like high frets. But I started going for frets that are not only high but a little skinnier. It, it seemed like it was better for the intonation, and also because the, the the scale is shorter, just had more room for my finger when I got to the got to the higher frets. You know, there was a little more fret room. Uh, the and then 
right around that time, I had gone to see Frank Marino, who was one of my biggest childhood guitar heroes. Great guitar player. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, was, I was watching him. You know, it was a recent show in 2000-something. And he just had the best tone. And, and, he, and he was playing a weird guitar. He had a, he had a, a Gibson SG with three single coils, hmm. wow. which is not something that you really ever see. You know, he had Strat pickups and a, and on a Gibson. And, but man, the tone he was getting was just unbelievable. And his bridge pickup was angled backwards. You know, I, I could tell what he was doing. He, was, he, he wanted to get a Hendrix sound because Hendrix was left-handed. So, you know, he had that Strat angle, right. but it was sort of reversed because he had the guitar upside down. And that's what Frank did. And Frank's a right-handed player, but he had it angled back. And I thought about it and I thought, well, that's kind of a good idea because, you know, the, 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 you, you, you might want some more definition out of the low strings, mm -hmm. but the high strings on a Strat, you know, they can really take your head off. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, at the time, I, I was wanting to kind of warm up and thicken up the, the high strings. You know, I didn't, they were bitey enough. I, if anything, I wanted to, you know, warm them up and give them some more beef. So um, w when I was doing the, my Photoshop experiment, I, I tried the, that one had single coils because I was trying to, you know, get the tone of Frank Marino. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did it to one in Photoshop and I thought, man, it would look cool to do the other ones like that. And so that's where the the angle came from. Interesting. And then you know th this the newer models have humbuckers, but you know with a single in the middle. But I still you know use the zebra pickup to kind of camouflage that in the black pickguard, so it still has the look of the three single coils. And of course it's got a you know it's wired up, so you can still get that kind of you know stratty. <laughs> you can still get a little bit of the twang out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a lockdown bridge, and most of the time, that's that's just easier for me to deal with. Um, I don't knock my hand in it. Sometimes I get a bruise from a whammy bar. You do because I'll because I, I play hard. You know, it's, I'm a rock and roll player. So when I'm sitting there, especially when I, I do a lot of muting on the high string, and if I'm if I'm muting there, you know, I've got my hand right next to where the whammy is, and I'll start bonking against it and get a, a bruise on my finger. And that's no fun. So. It's, <laughs> So I'll do that, and actually, I mean, this is again, it's really down to the detail. I like dots. <laughs> you know, so some guitars have like the compl complicated things going yeah, on yeah. there. It might look good at the store, but you know, you, you, lately I've been getting into more adult notes on the guitar, <laughs> and so I, I got to know where to put my fingers. And if, if there's if there's complicated <laughs> things going on, if there's a dragon or something, you know, or you know, or even. Even even the the, the uh, what do you call them the like the square rectangles sometimes those yeah, yeah. Throw, throw me right. off because right. you know I just want to see you know I, I need the dots but I need simple dots <laughs> and let's see anything else I think um, to me the, the, the pick art I designed I thought it was cool to have the like sort of a you know this point here this point here this sort of this, a, a, a symmetry thing and it just looks like a big electric brontosaurus to me. It does. I mean, it's it, it's it's. And I'm into dinosaurs lately. I've got a stegosaurus on my pick. Stegosaurus. Co correctly spelled, and I've I've got an electric brontosaurus. And actually, the, the this upper part really balances well when you when you stand up with oh, the really? guitar. You know, the the more and any I mean, it's just the, the, where the strapple is located. You know, if you if you mm -hmm. play a flying V or, or you know one of those guitars where the, where the, the strapple's further back this way. Yeah, yeah. You're you're just in for for problems. The things get you know. Actually, I don't know if V's do it so much, but you know, most a lot of guitars that are like that. They tend to be yeah, neck yeah. heavy, I know exactly and this just this is just beautiful standing up or or sitting down. It feels good as well. Interesting. You bring up an interesting point. Paul. You talk about uh, uh, grown up notes. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about uh, you've you sort of uh, uh, been checking out the blues recently. You always felt that maybe yeah. your blues playing was a little. I got angry at myself <laughs> because I, 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 the thing that I was my comfort zone for the longest time was that learn a scale and. You know, map it out on the neck, and I had spent enough time as a teenager, sort of, you know, copying eruption and Spanish fly, and I had a lot of facility with that three note per string kind of. You know, I could sort of burn through stuff. So when I went to GIT. I learned a bunch of new scales and, and substitutions. You know, you could take like you know, if you're playing a A7 and a blues, I could take the natural minor scale that I knew really well, the shape, and you'd move it up a whole step, and suddenly it would be mixolydian. And as long as I didn't emphasize anything, it would be okay. Now that's the important thing. Is like by, when you play fast, it allows you to not emphasize anything. Interesting. Because you just go. <laughs> 
and as long as the last note's okay, <laughs> you know, all the others, I mean, they're, they're, they're the right notes, right. but the, the thing that I've learned is as you slow down, you, some of the notes start to become more important than the others. It becomes less democratic, and it's more like this note. You know, when you land on something, it's like, um. that one I really mean. You know, the rest of them, they're on the way there. But even if you throw in a couple bad ones, nobody's going to notice. You know, but when you go, you know, you know, then those matter more. And in a way, you really have to know what you're doing a lot more. Because to me, like the seven note scales that I use for the longest time, that's too many notes to, to, to emphasize. I mean, you can use some on the, on the way. But when you want to emphasize ones, you, you've got to you've got to be more. You, you've got to pick them out. You've right. got to decide. You, you've got to make choose your favorites. Mm -hmm. You've got to make the greatest hits of the notes. <laughs> and and so that I could do pretty well with if it's with only one chord. You know, because I spent a lot of time playing stranglehold as a kid. You know, so if I'm doing, you know, I, you know, I can find the good ones there. If I didn't, you know, you know I, I know where to end for for stranglehold, but a blues has changes. You know, you you get your that you get your one chord, and even uh, I've come to realize that the one chord is a completely different thing than I thought it was. You know, I thought you know, if you're being a guitar player, everybody knows the minor pentatonic scale. You know, and you know, certain blues songs would work. If you're doing like "Born in a Bad Sign," that's kind of minor. You know, so if you're doing, it's got a minor, either, so you can get away with. It. A lot of the Led Zeppelin stuff, it's more minor, you know. So you can get away. You know, ACDC, so a lot of stuff yeah. I grew up really the minor worked. But as I started listening to BB King and uh, uh, you know the, who, who did I listen to a lot? Magic Sam, hmm. you know, and you know, getting into the old gospel stuff <laughs> and, and and jazz players that played blues, you know, sax and clarinet guys, I realized that their one chord is they're really putting a lot more emphasis on the major third than I was. It's, it's, it's not just inferred because with a little, you know, a little bend towards it. It's really, it's really played. And so I started to, first of all, you know, just try to know that and, and find it. I mean, the guys like Neil Sean are masters of just bending right to. Because, you know, Journey has a lot of major key songs, so he'll do that. Really hit the major dead on. You know that's no longer. It's more like. And that this is one of my favorite licks, where you start on the major third, and you just go up chromatically, and then you end with a minor, bend it back to the major, and hit your root. So that's a beautiful lick. So the other thing I started realizing is it's not just the third, it's also, it's a lot of like avoiding notes that you, your hand is used to because they don't, you know, fit the sound. So the one note that every guitar player, including me, you know, we, we hit is the, the minor seventh. And if you want to play major, you, you I got to play the major six instead. So instead of going, you know, you go... And that's not that's not bad up here in the first dot because it, it's an easy stretch for the fingers. In fact, it's actually easier than the, the stretch for the minor. So that's a nice one until you get down to the middle octave, like that right here. There you gotta get that big stretch, and it's kind of in a place where you don't really want it to be. So to me, I really had to work on fingerings that allowed me to get that major sound. Oh, sorry. And that sucked because I'm. But anyway, the, <laughs> which is, it's much more major blues than it is minor blues, mm -hmm. on purpose, you know, not just by accident, but and and also to do it in a swing feel. A lot of the blues has that swing. Yeah, yeah. So you're going. <laughs> And 
that's you know that's much more it's what was going on in the 40s maybe i mean i'm not an expert on it but when i listen back that's uh that's you know that's pre rock and roll mm -hmm, you know when chuck berry came out and sort of straightened everything out it's not swinging anymore i mean i love chuck berry that's that's where acdc came from absolutely and uh and certainly pre-1985 there were, there were a lot of rock bands that were great at swing you know van halen is a master right. of, of swing stuff you know you're doing the, was it, uh, yeah, totally swing the full bug or hot for teacher that's all and really swinging but at a certain point you know maybe it came from surf music because surf was it was like real you know uh it was real straight kind of was, yeah <laughs> the, 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 the torso's not moving for that music i love right. that too you know, or like the Ventures kind of, I don't really know Ventures songs, but I was like. <laughs> you know, it's just it's more, it's, it's more square. 